Hi everyone, I'm Jonna, head of the Elaine Turner Elite Stylist Division, and I'm so excited to be here today with my boss, role model, and fashion extraordinaire, Elaine Turner, whose new book, Breaking the Glass Slipper, launches August the 23rd, and we are so excited to read it. Elaine, how does it feel to have this labor of love finally launching? Well, actually, it feels like I've just finished running a marathon. <laughs> so I'm heading to the bar, and I'm going to just completely pamper myself in this, like a spa treatment or spa weekend yes. or something. No, but really, it's been a labor of love, a huge passion, and it did take a long time. I didn't ever realize writing a book what went into it. You know, just obviously, if you haven't done it, you don't know, so you can assume, but until you're doing it, you actually really realize, oh wow, this is a huge feat. So I'm very you know, proud of, of the product and I'm proud of myself for doing it. And um, I hope people love it as much I'm as sure, I do. I'm sure they will. So tell us about your journey to get here and what was the inspiration behind your book? Well, you know, I actually started writing about two or three years ago pretty seriously. I started writing as a form of healing and therapy, and I was writing in my journals a lot, and then it kind of led to this whole blog, Elaine's Musings, and I just started using my communication and writing skills as a way to connect with women and share my vulnerabilities and my journey. And so it's funny because the book actually, I started writing a book about two years ago about me and my daughter's journey. And it was very personal and I was just doing it on the side and kind of cataloging it, you know, on my computer. And then as I kind of moved along, I had some things sort of happen in my life that sort of shifted the stories that I wanted to tell. And um, as you'll read in the book, one of those was a woman I met in Dallas who I thought for a long time, if I wrote a book, I really wanted to write about really specifically me and my daughter. But after I met this woman, I realized she kind of enlightened me with this whole idea of what fashion can do in your life and how I think as women, as society, sometimes that we decide, you know, fashion can be frivolous or fashion is just materialistic or it's for a certain body type or, you know, if you have a certain amount of money in your bank account. And I felt like she enlightened me that day when she told me what fashion did for her and particularly the fashion that I was creating. And it led me on this journey of thinking about all of these myths that were told as women and that we buy into and how we shouldn't. And so it really started there and it kind of morphed this whole writing into this idea of me ultimately really connecting with other women about what, we, what we're fed and what we decide is true and untrue. And I really had this urge at that moment that I wanted to communicate all of those ideas. I love that, goosebumps. I have goosebumps. Uh, goosebumps. <laughs> Tell us, Aline, what ultimately do you want women to take from your book? I want them to read the book and number one, I kind of want them to feel like when they are engaging in these stories that I'm telling that they have this sort of, I don't know if you want to call it aha moment or feel enlightened to maybe cook. You know, I never thought of it that way. That's a big, for me, when I'm reading and I'm feeling like I'm engaging and feeling intimate with the writer, I sometimes those moments where I go, God, I never would have put that together like that. So I want women to feel that. I also want women to release this idea of perfectionism and feel like this journey is has really nothing to do with perfectionism. It has everything to do with vulnerability. And through vulnerability, I think we're empowered to share and we grow as women. So I really want it to be a connector, you know, a connector of women where we all feel like free to share, share our wounds, share our stories. And honestly, too, I just want her to laugh and have fun. I think we spend so much time taking ourselves so seriously in life. And I tried to inject my humor because without it, you know, I think we're lost. We got to have the humor to keep things because life is hard and it's a journey and it's it can be long you know and short I mean it, however you look at it so I want women to laugh and and feel like that they can relate I love that I love that so is there a favorite story or chapter in the book that you want to share with us today I mean, I guess, I, I think the story that I love the most is I love the breast pump story <laughs> I mean, <I> just, <laughs> 
<laughs> and it, it makes me laugh so hard, but um, I think it, it really happened. You know, I mean, obviously I told the story <laughs> and I shared it actually with my design team a couple, several years ago, because all the designers started having babies. And I think what I love about the story is obviously it was a moment, not my best moment. It was a weak <laughs> moment, but it also sort of the idea of shattering these myths that we have to embrace every aspect of motherhood perfectly and um, that we have to act like that it's all, you know, there's no issue with breastfeeding and there's no issue with not getting sleep. And the fact is we don't have to pretend that it's this fairy tale. You know, obviously there are so many beautiful aspects of mothering and being a parent, but there's also other sides that are very sacrificial and challenging. And I wanted to be able to share that story for anybody out there who might be also exhausted and feeling like I want to throw my breast pump down the <laughs> stairs. Yeah. And then I guess my chapter favorite would be um, vulnerability. It's probably my favorite chapter just because there's so many aspects of that to yeah. dive into. So vulnerability being our weakness, um, I think that that myth definitely needs to be shattered. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Knowing you, I know you are always so inspired by your readings <laughs> and, and discovering authors and really absorbing them. Who are your favorite authors and, and what about them really excites you? Oh gosh, I have so many. Um, I think I'm really inspired by um, narrative nonfiction and memoirs. Um, I think Kelly Corgan is one of my very favorites. She's author of The Middle Place and Tell Me More. Um, I think she does a great job of combining storytelling in a very relatable way, but she's so heart-centered and, so, and she's funny. So you read, it's just everything that I read that she writes, I just read it so quickly and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's so funny and she has, she's a great storyteller. I love Anne Lamott because I love how irreverent she is. I love her spiritual base and how she's almost angry that she's spiritual, you know, it's almost like she's a reluctant believer. Um, I love that honesty with Anne. Um, I mean, Brene Brown, I love because I feel like that she's just taught me so much about myself, about how I want to be. Um, so many of her guideposts and wholehearted living are, you know, all over my house. And I feel like she's kind of the ultimate teacher. Um, and, you know, I can also, I guess, take a nod to the classics. I mean, um, To Kill a Mockingbird is my favorite book, so I still, you know, love the novel and the greatest American novel in my mind and Harper Lee. And so I just love reading. I mean, I think it's an escape. It's healing. It's therapeutic. Um, I feel like it offers, offers all of us a chance to connect and feel like we're understood when we read. Yeah. I love the quote, running a business often feels like being stuck trying to solve the most difficult New York Times crossword puzzle. And about 10 years into the same damn riddle, you realize that you're solving it may not be the point. So in the 18 years of owning your own fashion company, what has been one of the most important lessons that you've learned? That's such a great question. I feel like, you know, that quote ultimately sort of meant that the magic really resides in the journey and not necessarily feeling like that you're reaching this finish line of perfect success. You know, I think what I've learned is that it's really ultimately about waking up every day and doing your very best to find out what is the next right thing to do, you know, and having an open mind about what that looks like because there's so many things out of our control in the world. There's so many external factors and we don't always have the control that we think we have. And I think that I've learned as an entrepreneur to be nimble and be adaptive and be open-minded to as much as I might have thought I want it to look a certain way, I need to be open to it looking another way. And I'm going through that right now. You know, I'm going through big changes and shifts in the retail industry through in brick and mortar and having to adapt to an industry that has gone very digital and it's focus um, very much about ease and convenience, as you know, with the concierge type services that you run. Um, and so my husband and I have really had to look in the mirror and say, as much as we thought it was going to look a certain way, we need to be open-minded to it looking a new way. And I think that in life, that is one of the biggest lessons you can learn is acceptance and adapting to what is, rather than being in resistance to it. I think so much in life isn't so much about 
um, the actual change that you need to do maybe isn't as hard as you think. I think it's your mindset of not wanting to change. You know, that that's a big part of sort of, I think, some of the, the push and pull of life. And, um, and also, I can't undermine or underestimate how important it is. I really think commitment is a huge part of running a successful business and great people. You know, you've got to have people who get it, who who are there for a reason, who are passionate. And so I feel like that it's ultimately all of those things. It's, just, it's not this whole idea of, you know, in our society we preach sort of success at all costs, you know. Really, ultimately, I don't believe in that. I believe that it is a journey and that you wake up every day and that you're open-minded to what the realities are and you think, you know, I'm not just going to become an overnight success. I'm going to have to really engage in this journey, whatever it brings. Absolutely. Um, in an early chapter, you share a poignant story about a time in your adolescence when you became aware of the masculine and feminine dynamic and, and how society expected you to be feminine, right? But how do you feel society has shifted since you were a little girl? And what do you feel the future holds for our daughters? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I wanted to talk about that because I think that there's a big awareness going on right now around gender, around gender identity, around the roles that we play, the traditional roles, the so-called traditional roles mm -hmm. we play as men and women. And, um, you know, I grew up in the 70s, so <laughs> a little old, but um, I grew up where it was a little more singular, you know, girls acted this way and boys acted this way. And I wanted to share kind of my, I don't know, my sort of conflict, if you will, inside about it, because I had very masculine energy and I still do. We all do. We all have the masculine and the feminine. And when I grew up, I, just for whatever reason, before the age of 10, I was, I was very masculine, you know, the way I presented myself to the world. You know, I was like on the field or I was in the pool or I was going to kick someone's ass. And, <laughs> you know, and my mom was like this sort of epitome of like the classic beauty going, what? What the hell is going on with my daughter over there? But I think what I've realized as I've aged is I've really learned sort of that balance within myself and embracing that feminine and then understanding and owning the masculine. And I think as far as this generation today, the younger generation, what's beautiful is there's a huge awareness around gender. There's a huge awareness around, you know, uh, some of the painful aspects of gender identity. And I think with that awareness brings conversation. It can bring some pain. You see a lot of grief, you know, involved. But what with that, when you walk through that pain and you get to the other side of that. And I think that this next generation is sort of dealing with that and sort of allowing that conversation to happen and allowing all of that energy and angst and what, you know, all of the so-called traditional barriers to break down. And I think that there's hope, a lot of hopefulness about where that where we'll land, the acceptance of all of that. And I see it in my own daughter. You know, she's both masculine and feminine, as we all are. And I see myself embracing all sides of her. And I think that as much as, as a society, we might wake up and see the news and feel there's a lot of negativity, I think you can look at it differently and feel that there's a lot of awareness and with that comes grief, and with that can come some uncomfortableness, but it ultimately leads to, I think, the truth. So I think that the, it's a beautiful time, even though it seems like so exhausting, right? We wake up and we're like, oh my God, you know. But I think that there's a lot of hope right now. Absolutely, absolutely. So speaking of your daughter, yeah. you write that the best teacher in your life thus far is your daughter, Marley. Would you share with us the biggest lesson that she has taught you? Yeah, um, you know, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, my daughter is sort of everything kind of was inspired by this journey. I mean, she's been my greatest blessing, but, you know, it's been challenging and it's been an unexpected challenge in my lifetime to raise a special needs daughter. Um, and who knows, you know, maybe the next book explores that, that in much more depth. Maybe I wasn't quite ready yet. And the book kind of took on this turn with women. And maybe as I get more comfortable, my next book will be really, really revealing um, the journey with my daughter. I, I, she, it's interesting, when you raise a child with challenges and differences, you know, many people kind of look at that and think, oh, you know, you are obviously such in service to this child. And they kind of look at it like you dominate or you guide her and you teach her and you, but really, 
it's that's not true. I mean, yes, I do do those things, but really I'm on the receiving end of also so much guidance and teaching. And when you deal with somebody that things don't come easily for, you realize you become very essential about what matters, you know, and there's, um, I don't even know how to put this in words because it's so profound, but the journey with someone with special needs is, I feel like you, your soul, you can actually feel your soul evolving <laughs> because you have, you're almost forced into a part of yourself that is, I think, activating at the highest part of yourself of acceptance, of empathy, of compassion. And ultimately all that really matters is love. And I think that when you deal with a soul that struggles, you, you get that a lot quicker than maybe other people would and who just haven't had that experience. And so my husband and I often talk about, even if we're crying, you know, going, oh my God, this is such a hard day, how lucky we are to experience and understand what really, really, really matters in life and what really matters is love, unconditional love. That's the only thing that matters. And she brings that to us every day. Don't make me cry. I know. I won't. Jonna. This is not an Oprah. Oprah round table here. <clears throat> so every chapter of your book ends with questions the readers can ask themselves to explore how each myth or each topic relates to their life. What inspired you to ask these questions and what do you hope that the reader gains from working through them? You know, I'm a big believer in questions that the questions really instigate the journey. And I think so many of us are programmed to believe that it's all about finding the answers. You know, I think that we have, as humans, we're programmed for this sort of black and white, concrete guardrails, guidelines, you know, this is how I'm gonna live my life and it's all gonna work out. But really, none of that works. So, I mean, you can believe what you wanna <laughs> believe, but it doesn't. And um, I feel like that my whole idea in wanting this sort of reflection period after each chapter was allowing women to engage and not having the answers, but asking the simple question. You know, have I been in a relationship with a male that was dysfunctional or whatever, you know, have, it's like almost like that exploration and that curiosity leads you to, I think, finding more of what the truth is within yourself. Not the answer per se, but understanding yourself better. Any type of self-definition or self-exploration is going to support and aid in your life. There's just no denying that. And so questions to me are the gateway to that, the gateway towards self-exploration and towards growth. I mean, ultimately we're all here to learn and grow and I feel like questions are the way that you do that. So I wanted women to read the chapter and feel like you know, she could just simply ask herself the question, maybe jot down a few ideas and allow that to simmer, you know, and who knows where it will lead. Absolutely. You know, it's like seeds, you know, you're planting these seeds. And so instead of, a, instead of being so stuck on what the answers are, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's my big thing. As women, we are programmed to believe that we can have it all. And we are always striving for this elusive work-life balance, <laughs> whatever that means. Yeah. Do you have any tips for women today navigating their life in their work or society in I general? Know. Yeah, I mean, I devote a whole chapter, it's our last chapter, to the myth, I believe, of having it all. and. Ultimately, you know, my advice, whatever that means, um, is even just having that type of credo, it's, it's, it's a little dangerous, right? Because the idea of having it all means something different to everybody. Mm -hmm. So trying to universally define that is dangerous because um, I think what happened, and, you know, we're all and such gratitude towards the women, especially in the 60s and 70s, who led this movement, right, of women um, liberation. What happened was I felt like that credo got defined in a very singular way, that having it all meant you had a successful marriage, children, and worked. I mean, that's kind of singularly how I think women looked at it, when in reality, you know, that to me doesn't define having it all. 
really ha what defines having it all is what you, what your truth is and what you consider is a true full life of having it all. And so I feel like we need to let go a little bit of these sort of linear ideas of what that looks like and allow people to have sort of a customized approach to having it all. And then ultimately my advice would be once you do that self-exploration and figure out what is my true kind of having it all mean? You know, today, another big point is things change, right? You're having it all might mean something today that it would mean totally different 10 years from now. But whatever it looks like in that moment, you have to make the choices and surround yourself with people that I think align with what that looks like for you. So, you know, you have to decide what's my priorities, what are my values, make those choices, you know, obviously it helps to have a support system and then try to create more and more of what that looks like for you. I think ultimately that's really all you can do, right? I mean, you can't just all of a sudden wake up one day and there's this magic fairy tale in of like, oh, I have it, it all worked out. You know, that just does, that's just not how life works. So I think again, it goes back to self-awareness and really knowing what is it that I want because that's so unique to all of us. It is. I mean, some of us want the career and some of us want to go work on a, a farm, you know, or, I mean, which is beautiful. I mean, so I think it's just up to that person. Uh, in the book, you candidly talk about failure. I love the quote, the journey between your questions and your answers is life. It's the journey that propels you. How do you use your failures as an opportunity to prepare, propel you? Um, you know, I feel like failure is such a, I feel like as a society, again, we're programmed to really stray away from it. You know, there's shame involved with it. I feel like that, especially as women, I mean, we put so much pressure on ourselves to, to do the right thing and to, to be perfect and not really experience those moments. But in reality, if you're human, you're going to fail. You're a human being living on the earth. There are going to be times that it's just going to work out. And that's okay. And I think for me, I failed a lot in my life. I'm going through some stuff right now feeling that way. And I think for me, I just try to look at it and say, I know this is how it feels, this perceived failure. I like to call it perceived failure rather because I don't really believe in failure. And I decide, okay, what is the opportunity? What is the knowledge I'm gaining? What is the gateway through that failure that just will ultimately make me better? So looking at the situation with new eyes. I mean, everything so much in life is looking at it. It's the mindset. It's not so much what's really happening. I think we get real stuck on that, but it's really how we're choosing to look at it. So I try to look at my failures and decide, how can I use this to my benefit rather than I'm going to curl up in my bed and go away for six months? Now... A little of that is okay too, okay? <laughs> Binge watching and drinking wine is totally okay, I would say for at least a week. And then you might wanna move again and you know. But it's totally, I mean, we all have to visit Pity City. We just can't live there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, final question. Final question, Jeopardy! So you are a successful designer, an entrepreneur, and now an author. What's next for <laughs> Elaine Turner? Um, well, that's sweet of you to say, but I do think my big message, and I hope this come ac comes across in the book, is that I'm a work in progress, just like everybody else. I don't really ultimately believe in these final, I've got it all, you know, I'm on the mountaintop. Obviously, sharing with you today, I'm, I'm a work in progress. We're dealing with certain things in our lives at, a lot of times where we're transitioning and trying to find our way. Um, but I would say, you know, my intuition tells me that the next step for me is really exploring more of this connection and sharing of women. So more writing, I think more public speaking, um, I think creating environments and experiences for women to come together. I think that's what's like really speaking to me, um, in a intuitive level, but you know, I just kind of try to follow the breadcrumbs and see where the next right thing is and just do my very best to shine the light. That's all I can do and cuss a little bit. <laughs> That's all we can do. Elaine, I'm so excited to get my copy of Breaking the Glass Slipper, debunking the myths that hold women back out 
August the 23rd. We encourage all of you out there to follow along in the journey. Share your stories on how you break the glass slipper with hashtag break the glass slipper. And check out www.elaineturner.com for more information about how we are taking this movement to the next level. Thanks guys and thank you, Jonna. Thank you, Elaine.